David Maidis is actually Jewish, and he's, uh, he's been a student of the Holocaust, and he's done an enormous amount of work on that. In fact, he's on the Raoul Wallenberg uh, uh, investigation committee. We're both actually from the same city in Canada. We actually knew each other when we were very young, 16 or 17, at, at the university together, and we've both been interested in human dignity for all our lives, really. My mother and father were lucky enough that they could have uh, caregivers in our home in the late 40s and 50s who had come from places like Poland and uh, other countries where the Russians, Soviet Union had been and had done terrible things to people. And so these wonderful women w would tell me what had happened to their family or their cousins and, and at the hands of the Russians. So I, I think I learned about communism when I was maybe six or seven or eight years old. And, uh, and so uh, I had a sort of inner understanding of it. And so when I heard, learned what the Communist Party was doing in China, it was not a, it sort of brought back memories of what the Russians did to uh, people in Central Europe and Eastern Europe. People I had known and loved, they were, they were dear, dear, dear friends. So I, I guess it may have started there. And over the years, I've known people from Rwanda, friends from Rwanda, people from uh, Ukraine, a lot of countries that have been uh, treated abominably by, uh, by totalitarian regimes, whether Nazi or, or, uh, or communist. And as far as I'm concerned, they're virtually the same. The, the, the Nazis and the communists had, uh, the, yes, there were differences, of course, but uh, the methods were the same and are the same today. The totalitarian governments of any stripe think that people have no dignity, they have no value, and that they can do anything they want to them. And uh, uh, I sometimes worry that human life in China today has the no value whatsoever. And when you, and when you see what's happening to the Falun Gong practitioners, you, uh, you, you would have to think that's true. We were asked to, uh, to investigate by the coalition to investigate the persecution of Falun Gong. And uh, two of us agreed to do it independently. and. Uh, when we both learned the other was going to be doing it, I think we were both delighted. We've been doing it. We've been adding to our knowledge for seven years, and I think, I think uh, initially on our first report we did it after four or five months, and we were convinced that the allegations were true that that the uh, Falun Gong community were being killed for their organs, and their organs were being sold to to organ tourists from abroad and and to wealthy Chinese. And then we did a follow up report. And then I guess we did the book in 2009. And by that point, we had received so much evidence that we had no doubt whatsoever in our minds that, it, that it, this uh, we call a new crime against humanity or a new form of evil in the world was going on. And, uh, and the people would say, even I even heard this on this trip, that well, we need more evidence. Well, I think if you look at it, we have 52 kinds of evidence. Mm -hmm. And for some people, we'll never have enough evidence. But if we had 152, they'd say, oh, we need more evidence. But for fair-minded people in governments and parliamentarians and so on, and journalists, I don't think there's any doubt that the, the case has been proven. The fact that the government of China is now talking about uh, stopping uh, organ transplants uh, from prisoners, of course, they never mention Falun Gong prisoners. They always talk about prisoners who are subject to capital punishment. Wang Jiafu, for example, the former deputy minister of health, always talks about about uh, convicted criminals. And I've never heard the word Falun Gong come out of his mouth. He's admitted, for example, that he uh, did uh, two liver transplants for, uh, I think, since 1989, every week. And now he's involved with this new do donation program. And uh, I hope it works. I hope they do stop using organs from all prisoners. But uh, since it's so profitable and, and, and uh, they've been doing it for so long, I think it's going to take more even more pressure from the world community. And I think we're at the p tipping point where, where we're finding that talking to parliamentarians in Asia and in North America and Europe, I think we're at the point now where parliamentarians are going to pass laws that say it's, uh, if you buy a trafficked organ, uh, uh, pay for an organ, that's an offense. And uh, uh, New South Wales is talking about this in um, Australia. We've been to the Irish parliament and I think they're looking at this sympathetically. I was in the British parliament last week so, and now, of course, in Sweden, I, I hope that parliamentarian, parliaments will pass laws like this right across the world. We're going to keep going until this stops, along with thousands and thousands, if not millions of other people, until the 
the pillaging of organs of Falun Gong stops in China. We are going to keep going. We're going to last longer than, than the party state in China. When they stop, we will stop. Yao Zhisheng is, is, in my view, he's a Nelson Mandela or a Mahatma Gandhi figure in China. He's called the conscience of China. He's an extraordinary person who, uh, who was uh, born and raised in a cave, of all things. His family was so poor that he, that he, uh, he couldn't go to university, he couldn't go to law school. He, he, when he got out of the army, he uh, managed to pass the bar exam, which uh, it shows how brilliant he is. And then he became one of China's ten best lawyers. He defended the poor, the disabled, the farmers who were being thrown off their land. He was a, a national hero. And then one day he decided, I have to defend Falun Gong because they're being treated atrociously, inhumanly. And he uh, took up that cause. And uh, it seems to me that that's the only thing that caused the party state to come down on him like a ton of bricks. And he was his license was taken away. They had. Do you know they had policemen living in their home? He was in jail, but living with his wife and two children, there were policemen in the house. It was, it was uh, uh, Adolf Hitler couldn't have designed a worse form of intimidation, persecution. So he, uh, he's been in jail now off and on for seven years. He's been tortured inhumanly, barbarically. Uh, they've done things to him that no regime in, in the in the 20th, 21st, or any century should do to any human being, let alone a model citizen like Gao Shisheng. So we've, uh, we've, actually David Mattis and I and others have nominated him for the Nobel Peace Prize, and uh, I hope, I still hope that he'll get it. Possibly, uh, I've had some encouragement that maybe he'll get it uh, this year or next year. In a democratic China, I'm convinced that somebody like him would end up as the, uh, as the leader of the country. They're certainly afraid of him. Uh, I mean, just as the apartheid regime in South Africa was afraid of Nelson Mandela. Then they came to realize that the only way they were going to be saved from terrible things happening to the regime was to let a man who believes in forgiveness and reconciliation become president of a democratic South Africa. And, of course, Nelson Mandela did exactly that. He, he didn't seek revenge. He didn't seek uh, to shoot people and that sort of thing. He wanted people to get along. And he did it better than perhaps anybody in recent history. So that's what that's what a Gao Zhisheng would do for the the, the the party in China, in my view. He would not uh, he would not take revenge on them the way the regime has taken revenge on him. That's why I say he's like Nelson Mandela or Mahatma Gandhi. Many people simply cannot believe that in the 21st century something like this could be happening. It's something out of science fiction. It's something out of a horror story or a horror movie. And in fact, they made a horror movie in, about it a few years ago. And there was one in, made in Korea where a young couple were, were uh, on their honeymoon and they went to China and somehow the woman disappeared and her organs were taken from her. And this was a very popular fictional movie, but mm -hmm. we're not talking fiction, we're talking reality. So people, um, so people don't want to believe it. That's the first thing, and that's perfectly understandable. But at some point, even though you don't want to believe something, if the evidence is simply overwhelming, You've got to tell yourself that you've got to accept it and then to do something about it. That's the problem. Is a lot of people probably accept that it's happening, but they just don't want to do anything about it. And they have to do something about it. We all have to do something about it. We have about 20 recommendations in our book, or both books. But probably the best one is that the countries outside of China should stop buying the organs from, from China. That's one way. Then uh, we have to... Uh, we have to do about many other things, but we have to, to any place anybody from China goes, they have to be confronted with this thing. You are killing your own citizens who do gentle exercises and who, who are nonviolent, who are nonpolitical, who believe in truth, compassion, forbearance, as the Falun Gong community does. You are killing these people for their organs. What, what, uh, what outrageous behavior. Are you a civilized government? Are you, are you worse than Hitler? Are you worse than Stalin? We can all do something. We can phone our member of parliament. We can write a letter to the editor. We can, uh, we can go to a cocktail party and tell a Chinese diplomat that this is, this is terrible what they're doing. I, I was at a, an event in Korea last year and uh, somebody from the, uh, from the uh, Chinese, uh, he's, he's not in the government, he's from a non-government organization in China. He got up and he made this wonderful speech about the environment. 
and it was all most of it was nonsense as far as I'm concerned. But he got he made the speech, and so I got up and asked him, "Well, when is your government going to stop killing its own people for their organs?" And he sort of stumbled around, and he, he the usual answer. He said, "Oh, there's no evidence of that that it's happening," and you know, just just gibberish. So we all have opportunities when we can confront either the officials of the government or our citizens of China. And if they realize they're being they're being ridiculed wherever they go and condemned wherever they go, I think the the pressure would build from the top and the people at the t top would would respond. I think they're doing it actually now. I think the, the fact that this um, latest <laughs> plenary of the party last week and the week before has come out and saying they're not going to take organs from uh, from prisoners anymore is a step in the right direction. It's easy to promise this, and it's been promised before, but the fact that they feel they have to promise it shows that they're getting a lot of pressure within the country and from outside the country. And basically, naming and shaming is the thing that I'm convinced that the, uh, mm. the, the party state in China responds to. And people say, oh no, don't upset them, don't say anything like this, but no, the, the, what they need to hear is people saying, uh, there is not another government in the world that kills its own citizens and sells their organs to foreigners, let alone nationals. Basically, it's about a half a million dollars. If a Falun Gong practitioner is killed and their organs are sold, now the organs uh, don't last very long. They have to be be transplanted quickly. But if if they can, if they could transplant all the organs, including the skin and lungs and all everything, I mean, it's, it's corneas. It's, if they could if they could transplant all of those immediately before the organs become unusable, I think it adds up to about a half a million dollars. But if you take 60, say 60,000 Falun Gong practitioners times a half a million, what does that work out to? It's a, it's a huge amount of money. And it's, a, it's a, if there ever there was ill-begotten proceeds from crime, crime against humanity, that's it. We are asking people, if they can get the name of a doctor or doctors who are doing these transplants, to please get us their names. We have a number of the names in our recordings where we phone a hospital and a doctor will identify himself and will say, yes, there are Falun Gong practitioners available for, for, uh, for taking organs from. And we've got their names, but we want all the names we can get so that these names can be provided to the International Criminal Court. And these people, I hope, will face the uh, felt be on the docket in front of the International Criminal Court for crimes against humanity, because that's what these things are. And so, uh, and if, hopefully doctors, if they realize that people are trying to get their names and are getting their names, some of them will say, I'm not going to do uh, these operations anymore. Mm -hmm. And I have any, one of the examples we cite in the book is, uh, is a doctor who removed, the, it's, it's, it's hideous, he removed the corneas from 2,000 Falun Gong practitioners over a two-year period. And uh, we have his name and so on. And um, we, uh, eventually he stopped. He was having nightmares. He could, couldn't sleep. and. Uh, He'd been paid the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of U.S. dollars, his wife told us, and he left the country. I don't, I'm not sure where he is now, but these are the kinds of people we want their names and their, uh, as much information about them as we can so that we can have them ready when, uh, hopefully, uh, when China becomes a democratic country, these people will go, these people will go to the International Criminal Court. They were, we can imagine 2,000 over a two-year period. They were being run through his his operating room uh, at a, a high, high, pretty high rate of speed. It only takes about 20 minutes, I'm told, for remove remove a cornea from somebody's eye, so or two corneas. But uh, yeah, no, he, these were people who were being forced to do this. It was uh, it was a crime against humanity of the worst kind. He would take the corneas out, and then they they were under anesthetic. They'd be taken into another room, and then all their organs would be taken out. In, um, initially in several other rooms, but finally they did all the operating operations in one room, mm -hmm. and that's and then the bodies were burned. So your ten, two thousand people were killed uh, just in that one hospital. The doctor knew they were Falun Gong practitioners, mm -hmm. and he told his wife this. Mm -hmm. Now, I was a prosecutor for ten years, and somebody's going to say, "Well, that's not that's hearsay evidence because you have to get that out of his mouth, not out of his wife's mouth." But reasonable people who aren't who aren't hung up over fine points of procedure would accept, I think, readily that, and especially if they read her statement, which is in our report, which is available in 18 languages on our website, uh, uh, david-kilgore.com, uh, would read her statement and would say, this is a woman who's 
been told all these things by her husband, and, and it's as if it's coming from his, his mouth. And since you can't, he won't talk to you, you can't t talk to him, you, have, you can count on his, uh, on his wife's evidence. And if you don't like her evidence, and some people don't, you've got 51 other kinds of evidence. And uh, at some point, 51, 50, 49, at some point, most people will say, yes, I am absolutely convinced this is happening. And, and unfortunately, uh, uh, most people, uh, David Matus and I are completely convinced it's happening. And we, we become more and more certain it's happening as we get, we talk to more people. We talk to one person, I better not mention the country. He's doing fine, his health is, is good. But he told me that in a, over about a, a year long period, he went to the Shanghai number one people's hospital twice. First time, a, a, a major tan, a surgeon in military uniform of all things, brought him four sets of kidneys and none of the kidneys were compatible with his body. So he came, went home for three months, came back about three months later, and he got four more sets of kidneys. And finally, the eighth set of kidneys worked, and he's home doing fine. But eight human beings are dead. And I'm sure that, I mean, I don't have the names, but I'm sure that at least half of those people are Falun Gong, victims who have been convicted of no crime. A policeman has signed a little form, and they go off to the forced labor camp. And then, as I explained to people, the, the, uh, when the computer says that the, you're a match for somebody in Shanghai Hospital coming from Canada or Sweden or someplace, uh, that person is killed. And the uh, person comes home with a new kidney or liver, and of course they're told they're getting it from a convicted murderer or something. But uh, which t we explained very clearly that the only people in these camps who are examined medically every three months are the Falun Gong practitioners. And the other prisoners aren't examined at all. So it's for obvious reasons yeah. that the Falun Gong, because they don't smoke and drink, are the, considered to be the best people mm. to get organs from. So it's, it's a no-brainer to, mm. to, for people to, I think, understand if, if they know these things, that uh, Falun Gong practitioners are being killed for their organs. How many? Uh, we're asked that a lot. Um, David Matus and I estimated that from 2001 to 2005, six, it was about 41,500 transplants could only be explained by as coming from Falun Gong practitioners. Uh, Ethan Gutman, mm -hmm. uh, who did his, went at his research in a different way, estimates that it's about, it's about 60,000 Falun Gong practitioners that have been killed for their organs in these forced labor or concentration camps. And if you project us up to 2008 too, our figures are remarkably s similar. Uh, it's sort of 50, 60,000 human beings have been killed for their organs in China. An awful lot of people have been sent there, as you know, on the police signature. There's no hearing, there's no appeal, there's no trial, there's no charge. Some uh, obedient policeman comes up to somebody and says, uh, you're going to a camp, signs the form, and off they go for up to four years. That's a method that was, that was devised by Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin and was imitated by Mao in the 50s, as I'm sure you know. And uh, the model is still working, what, 60 years later? Even, I mean, Russia long ago got rid of that system. So why, the, why is it still working in China? That's the question that we should be asking every Chinese official and every party official that we, anyone sees anywhere in the world. There are still an awful lot of people, of which probably at least half are Falun Gong practitioners in these camps across China that are making, uh, they're making products like Christmas decorations or garments or, or toys or, or you name it. Uh, they're people, I've talked to people who've got out of these camps who, t one woman I'm thinking of, who told me she used to s sew uh, sweaters. Well, in fact, it was Jennifer Zhang told me she used to s sew sweaters all day. And um, other people have told me that too. And, and where do these products end up? Do they end up in stores and here in Stockholm or in Ottawa or in or New York? I suspect an awful lot of them do. And how come, uh, how come the government of Canada, the government of Sweden, allows these products into our countries? Uh, what we need, of course, is a, is a, a law that makes it, puts the onus on the importer to show that what he or she's bringing into S Sweden or Canada is um, is not made by slave labor, forced labor. The United States has an agreement to ban products from forced labor coming into the U.S., but they don't enforce it. And uh, there's a country in Asia that maybe I better not name that has a free trade agreement with China. And I asked one of the officials 
what they were going to do to, to prevent such imports. And he said, oh, we're going to have an inspector in Beijing. One inspector. So let's get serious about this. Let's say, let's say we're going to, we're going to be, we're going to be show some backbone. We're going to show some smarts on this. We're not going to allow our kids to have play with dolls and toys and whatnot that are made by somebody who's working 16 hours a day for no pay in a, in a forced labor camp in China. The 610 office was set up after the persecution, or at the time of the persecution, started in, in uh, mid-99, July 99, and uh, they were authorized to, uh, to uh, run this thing across China. And uh, I talked to a, a policeman in Australia a number, several years ago who had told me that, and this is maybe typical, is that he was, uh, he was told that if somebody was coming out of uh, a labor camp, a Falun Gong practitioner, and that if he and his colleagues had any doubt that the person was going to go back to being a Falun Gong practitioner, he told me they were authorized to shoot the person. Can you imagine giving that authority to the police in a 21st century? Any country. And fortunately for him, he uh, simply said, he, I guess he couldn't take this, and he's, uh, he, he, ban he, he fled China, and he's now in Australia. I, think, I believe he's a citizen of Australia. But that's the kind of mentality that was operating there. It's, it's a lot. It's 52, I think I counted 52, and, and uh, 52 different kinds of evidence. We uh, usually just say we have numerous kinds of evidence. Uh, and some of them, some of them, anybody can, I think, understand, and others are more complicated and, and are maybe more indirect. But uh, putting them all together, uh, they, they, they amount to, a, I think, a conclusive body of, of proof that this is happening. We often refer to the phone calls that where we, we would have people speaking, speaking uh, excellent Mandarin or Ch Chinese, and they would... Uh, they would call the hospitals uh, across the uh, across the country, or and uh, ask, tell them they were trying to get a Falun Gong organ for transplant, mm -hmm. and uh, they'd ask for a doctor. And quite often, in the early days, they could get doctors who'd tell them in 2006, and the doctor would say, "Yes, we have things like we have Falun Gong practitioners available through the courts or through the police," and we then um, we then uh, I'm trying to find the map here. We'd then uh, make a note of where it was, and we, we, got in, we hired independent um, translators to make sure it was an accurate transcript. And we have it in the book and in the report and on, on tape. We have, we've kept these tapes, too. And uh, one, uh, well, there we are. That's the, uh, if you can see the dots there, wherever there's a dot is where we found a hospital or a detention center where uh, we could get someone saying on tape that they had, uh, they had Falun Gong practitioners available for, uh, for, for organ pillaging. Uh, now, if you can imagine, because it, it's so stupid, one of the uh, things they did to rebut this is they got one of the doctors we spoke to, and I think he's in here, and they got him to say on a tape made in by Phoenix Television that, yes, I got a call on that day from, from somebody calling about this, and yes, I spoke to them. But I didn't say anything about this. I said this, this, and this, denying it, in other words. In other words, uh, now they were doing this in, in, in Mandarin, but the, we had the, his voice. Did they think we spliced his voice in saying something completely different? But I guess they, they, they assume people, everybody's stupid, that we would, uh, <laughs> that we, 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 were, we, we, we doctored the conversation. So I mean that's the level of their rebuttal, and it's just so it's so mindless and it's so it's so stupid that uh, we think uh, we don't think anybody any reasonable person would have any doubts about the, the the overall effect of the evidence. Of course, you don't see this on television anywhere because uh, these these uh, uh, murders are taking place in operating rooms, and nobody's going to get a. There have been a few photographs that have been taken out, as you know, but there's, it's hard to get it out. Unless people see it on television, a lot of people don't believe it's, it can happen. And they say, we want to see it on television. Well, we can't show it on television because they, uh, the, um, the surgeons aren't going to take films of it. And, uh, and the, and the so-called victims, are, are the, the victims are dead. So that's, the, that's probably the difference. If I wish dearly that we could get somebody to film one of these operations. But thus far, we haven't been able to get that. We've had some uh, very interesting things happen. Um, 
uh, I was hearing earlier today, and, I, and, and apparently it's available on Epoch Times, about a, somebody sent a taped conversation of when Bo Lai was in uh, the Kapinski Hotel in, was it, was it in Berlin? And, uh, and um, somebody um, taped the conversation where they, somebody called from the Chinese embassy and said, uh, and, and they, it's all there, which room are you, Mr. Bo? And then the question was, well, who authorized you to commit this uh, pillaging of Falun Gong? We've got apparently Bo's voice saying it was uh, President Jiang Zemin. And, the, and apparently there's more too that was said, but uh, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty good evidence because it's everybody knows it was Yang Zemin that started the persecution and uh, now we've got Bo Shi Lai who was pro as you pro know probably the lead uh, the lead persecutor of Falun Gong in his region his state uh, admitting it and um, this fellow uh, Yang Li Jung the police chief who went into the American consulate we've had some uh, rather extraordinary statements remember he got an award for for doing uh, I think the figure is the thousands of, uh, ex of uh, operations on, on the people taking their organs out. And he's making a speech saying it's, what is it? He said, it moves the soul to do something like this. Can you imagine? This is, this is, uh, this is uh, not a human being who's saying this, but he does. So if people, if people are open-minded and they're prepared to look at the evidence, I don't think anybody will have any doubt that this is... Uh, this has happened, and it's still happening, and it's got to stop. And we're, as I said earlier, we're going to keep going until it is stopped. We've got a whole chapter in the book on the, on the patients, and why they do it, and why they're desperate, and and uh, somebody thinks they only have six months to live, and they say to themselves, "Well, I'm going to go and get a, a liver in in China," and. Uh, well, these operations are often terribly badly done. The doctors in China won't give any uh, charts now to come back with the patient because they don't want their names to be on it. So the, a lot of patients, I gather, have the operations badly done. One man I heard about recently was, was being practically taken into the operating room after paying, uh, I forget how much it was, it was a lot of money he paid for his organ, and somebody said to him, we need another $10,000. So the man, I think, produced the ten thousand uh, dollars, and but it's uh, it's pretty it's pretty hideous stuff. It's clandestine. There's sort of back corridors in these hospitals. It's just from what we've heard from people who've gone through it, it's a very sordid process, and uh, you come away uh, with no information to take back to your doctor for aftercare where you came from, and it's uh, it's just like the mafia. <laughs> of medicine, if you like, and, and uh, it's it's an awfully depressing, sordid business. But if people are desperate, they will convince themselves of almost anything, especially when the doctor says to them, well, the organ you have, Mr. S Mr. Uh, S uh, Smith, is from, uh, is from a convicted murderer. And so then the person must wonder, well, has this person got AIDS? Have they got some terrible disease? And this, I mean, it's, but people are desperate, and we understand that. But um, and we would do anything to try to encourage people to give more voluntary organs in, in Canada or Sweden or anywhere. And interestingly enough, the, one of the countries that's taking the toughest stand on this is Spain. And yet Spain is also the country, as I'm sure you know, that has the highest rate of organ donors, voluntary donors. So, and, and Israel has discovered with their law that uh, by saying that anybody who signs a form volunteering to donate their organs will have priority when it comes to organ transplants. So they've found that their legislation has apparently increased the number of people signing their donor cards. So there are lots of things that can be done, but uh, one of the things that, that should not be done is people should not be going to China for, for as organ tourists. The idea is, of course, to throw the brokers in jail, and that's, those are the people to go after. And I think Israel did that, by the way. They put one of the brokers in jail. And once the brokers are out of business, then people don't even know how, even if they want to go, don't know how to access the means of going to China. So the people who really go after the brokers, and these people are are uh, unscrupulous people uh, that should be should be put in jail, in my view. Dr. Jay Lavi, he's got a chapter in this book, and I have I have uh, I have so much respect for Dr. Lavi. He uh, he didn't believe it was happening until uh, one day his. Uh, one of his patients said, I'm going to get a, a heart operation, I think it was. I'm going to 
China next two weeks from now to get a heart operation. And Levy says, you're what? You're gonna, they, they've timed the operation for two weeks from now? And you may not realize then that it takes, with the dish, dish types and blood type differences, you've got to have a large number of people who are same blood type and tissue type. So he immediately knew that somebody was going to be killed like a chicken in a poultry plant so that he could get a new, uh, a new heart. So that, the penny dropped for him on that, and he started the uh, campaign to change the laws in Israel, and he, and he and the members of parliament in Israel did this, and now it's, a, it's an offense to use a trafficked organ, and nobody goes, I believe, nobody has gone from Israel to China and since this legislation was passed. So if it works for Israel, why wouldn't it work for Canada or Sweden or any other country where we believe in human dignity and, and the rule of law? And we're not saying you have to name China in this, just have a law that says you cannot buy an organ. And, and you can act, you could build in an onus section that says that if uh, you come back with an organ, you have to show that you made a reasonable effort to find out it was, it was donated and so on. In fact, there's a big uproar going on right now in Sri Lanka. You may have read about this, where they're, uh, uh, Sri Lanka and Colombo is trying to set themselves up as an organ center. And there's a considerable worry that uh, the Rajapaska government in Sri Lanka may start to use the same methods as China. Certainly the Rajapaska government in Sri Lanka is, is far too close, in my view, to the government of China, and they may see this as a chance to make money as well through similar methods. Up to now, uh, Sri Lanka has only been using organs, or one kidney, for example, uh, bought, I gather, in some cases in, in India. But uh, there's a danger that we get onto a slippery slope and then other countries which don't have the rule of law or don't have uh, respect for human beings could end up doing the same thing. That's why it's got to be stopped with China and we've got to take a, we've got to uh, draw the line in the sand with China on this issue. He knew what was happening to the people who were anesthetized after he did the corneas he could see what was happening to them in the next operating room. And I guess eventually he, uh, he had, as I think I mentioned, he was having nightmares, he couldn't sleep. And his wife, Annie, said to him, you must stop doing this. It's, it's, it's hideous. He removed the corneas from 2,000 Falun Gong practitioners over a two-year period. I've seen some other accounts of what happened to surgeons who do this, but uh, it's, this, this kind of information does not get out very easily. It's kept very much uh, under control. Yeah, we've heard some really appalling stories, which we account, we account in the book a bit about how patients are treated and how they're uh, how they're uh, they're told they have to register, for example, under a Chinese name, because since 2008 there's been a huge pressure on the government not to sell them to foreigners, to sell them only to Chinese nationals. So people will go under and will, will be. Uh, will be registered under a phony name, a Chinese name. Uh, but uh, I wish I had more uh, evidence of what's, what's, how it's struck. Uh, but let me try to explain that a little bit. I, I, I became aware of this quite recently, that with this forced abortion policy for the second child, that uh, somebody was telling me the other day that when uh, a child would be born to, to a mother who had already had a child, instead of putting the child up for adoption or something, the doctors would stand around in this operating room and they'd think about what's the most effective way of killing the child. So they would, I guess in the one case, they would give the child vaccination with water in the child's head, the child would die. Well, how can you, if you are so dehumanized by doing operations like that, how does it become a problem to, to to take the corneas out of a person's eye or an organ out of a person. This, our doctors in the rule of law countries take an oath, of course, to protect human life. But when, you're, when your medical problem today is how you're gonna kill a newborn baby, a perfectly healthy newborn baby, what does it do to your, what does it do to your, uh, your sense of humanity and, and your professional ethics? And I guess that's how these doctors that are doing these operations uh, for lots of money think, uh, well, that's fine, that's just another day. I'm just a butcher in a butcher shop and uh, this human being is just like a slab of beef or something. I mean, I don't know how they do it. And it's, it, I've often thought we should ban any doctor involved in organ transplant should not be allowed to go to any civilized country. Now people will take great offense when I'm in effect saying that China is not a civilized country, but in this area it's it's barbaric, and the doctors who are doing it are barbaric. I uh, 
recall uh, several years ago, there was a transplant conference in Boston, and, and uh, all the transplant surgeons from around the world came. And one of the surgeons from Tianjin, where they do a lot of this work, uh, was talking to uh, uh, a friend of mine and his wife, and uh, there was a Falun Gong demonstration going on outside the, the, the hall. And uh, actually, Hillary Clinton spoke to the, the meeting at about the same time. And this doctor was uh, was saying to uh, my friend happened to be from Germany, and the doctor from Tianjin pointed out how many liver transplants they did at his hospital. And my friend said, that's as many tr liver transplants as we do in all of Germany in a year. And uh, then he said, well, where do you get your organs from? And the doctor's answer, and it's in the book actually, was ask the people demonstrating outside. Now, is that an admission of guilt? <laughs> I would think that any jury that I've ever appeared in front of would take about five minutes on that to, to, to find the, uh, that profession guilty. And I don't know why those people are allowed to go to any transplant conference in, in, uh, in countries that practice, uh, practice uh, medicine the way we do in, in most of the world. I think, you, in fact, you could probably argue that it's only in China where medicine is practiced this way. It goes back to what I was saying about when human beings have no more value than a, than a goat or something or a, or a chicken, this is the kind of thing that could happen. It's, it's, it's unimaginable in the 21st century. The party has a parallel government, so in every government office there's a party official who's basically telling the official, the public official, what to do. So, yeah, state organs is, is certainly an accurate title for what happens to organ pillaging in China. It's done by the state for the state to the benefit of, of participants. And the, the, the secondary goal in it, if not the primary goal, is to get rid of so-called enemies of the party, the Falun Gong practitioners. The numbers grew so quickly from 92 to 99, 70 to 100 million by the government's own estimates, and their values uh, are so different from the parties that they were terrified of, of certainly the two factors, if not, if, not, if not both. I met a young woman in um, in London, whose uh, whose father was a practitioner, Falun Gong practitioner, he was thrown in jail. He was he was sentenced to I think 11 years in jail. They usually don't bother going to some kind of a court hearing. Her mother was thrown in jail. The police literally t t sort of dragged her mother away one night, and they left her in the apartment. I think she was 12 or 14 or something like this. And the father was in jail. I mean. It, it, this is for this is for believing in truth, compassion, forbearance. It's just it's just impossible for, uh, for, for me to understand, and I think for most people to understand how any regime on earth could treat its people this way. But yeah, that that was the case. But there's so many cases like that. I mean, we've we've talked to uh, we've talked to dozens and dozens of people like this, and. Uh, they're all wonderfully sweet, kind people uh, without a vicious bone in their body or, and they have nothing but goodwill for people and yet they're treated this way. It's a bit like the way the, the Christians were treated by the Roman Empire. The people were believed in helping others and kindness and so on. And these monsters from Rome would come along and say, we're going to burn you at the stake, uh, Nero, for example. <laughs> and they would light Christians. They would light them with fire and well it's, it's it's the parallels are rather striking similar and as we say at the end of this book if you recall we say that the values of Falun Gong truth compassion and forbearance are really the values of most of the Chinese people and that's probably why this vicious contemptible people in group in the party are so unhappy and worried about them so it's probably based on fear more than anything else that they're uh, treating Falun Gong so badly the doctors against forced organ harvesting has been, have been the best by far we have, in fact, we have a wonderful doctor, Chinese doctor from China coming tomorrow, Dr. Li, coming to speak to the parliamentarians here. Wait till you hear what he has to say. I heard him in, in uh, London, I heard him in Wales. He's got some new material that is extremely, uh, extremely, uh, because he explains the mentality of how this could happen, that how you could, uh, your sense of humanity you could go so low that you could, uh, you could allow these things to happen. And he's, uh, he's a doctor himself. So we've got, uh, we've had some, um, DAFO is doing the best job. I'm hoping that we can get a thing 
called Parliamentarians Against Forced Ar Organ Harvesting. That would be wonderful if we could get that going here in, in Sweden and other countries. Uh, we've had the UN rapporteurs against torture have, have done uh, have done some good good things. Uh, European Parliament has had hearings. Uh, I think they passed a resolution condemning it. New South Wales Parliament has got a bill to make it a crime to use a trafficked organ. The Irish Parliament looks like they may maybe pass a similar bill. Uh, I wish I could say the Canadian Parliament was at that stage yet. It's not. Uh, but um, uh, we've had hearings in, in a number of countries. Um, I think we're getting close to the tipping point where suddenly everybody will realize we've got to have this kind of a legislation. But uh, we're not quite there yet.